Well, hello everyone, Stakuyi here. And I'm Gabby. And welcome back to the podcast, my hoes. Now, you're probably seeing us like this, different different setup. If you're watching it, at least. If you're watching it on YouTube. YouTube. Yes, on the YouTube. Yeah, see, here's the thing. We're going to be probably be switching this up in many, many different ways. I have no idea what this thing is going to look like in the end, because we're experimenting with different parts of our house, trying to figure out where it is that we can properly record and get things set up so that it sounds and looks nice. Which is really hard to do. We it's really do not hard. have a big house, and we have a toddler, so our house is pretty much taken up everywhere. His office is the garage, so we can't record in the garage. We Otherwise, echo, echo, echo. Yeah, like we typically record like in our closet, but we can't film in our closet. No, no. I mean, don't get me wrong. I want to show off my collection of T-shirts from the uh, early 2000s, but I don't think that my wife would be too happy if I actually show those off. So, here we are. But anyway, if you are wanting to see us, if you aren't just listening to us on Apple or Spotify or wherever it is, please make sure to check out the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel so that you can actually physically see us. But before you begin even doing that, please make sure to consider supporting us and this channel on Patreon. Because if you become a $1 patron, then that means that you're going to get access not only to the patron-exclusive podcast episodes, but also the regular episodes with no advertisements. So that's just where we put it so that you don't get interrupted by someone telling you to get Geico when you're in the middle of learning about some horrible car accident that happened in history. Which, actually, we could do that. We could do terrible accidents. That could be a thing. I think that would be terrible accident. Like Halloween. Car accidents. Like for Halloween. Like some kind of horror thing of, like, just terrible accidents and things that have occurred. Atomic disasters. Nuclear disasters? Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, technically speaking, the episode that we're doing right now, because this is the Chirp Audiobook Book Club pick, this one is going out on the 28th. So that is before Halloween, so we're technically not going to have a Halloween one, because this is less horror and more so the candy side of stuffing yourself with food and things. Which, I guess, at that point, I know I'm off on a little bit of a tangent, but it is related, I swear, because... Today's episode for Chirp Audiobooks, if you do not know what that is, Chirp Audiobooks is an audiobook service that allows you to get audiobooks for very cheap. Like every month we run a special where you get one for like three or four dollars. And this month's pick is going to be uh, The Edible History of Humanity by Tom Standage. Wait, isn't which, that the guy that yeah, did the that's, that's, drinks? That's, yes. The beer, wine, yes. coffee. Okay. Yep. He just likes food history. Is yep. he a food historian? I probably should have looked that up before okay. writing this episode. Well, I'm going to look okay, it up Okay, now. look it up. Literally look it up right now. I'm not sure, but I've seen his stuff before. And yes, Gabby is right. He is the same guy who did the History of the World in Six Glasses, which is the one that we did a couple months back about wine and beer and all different kinds of stuff. That one was fast. I love that. I love food history. I really do. Because history and food is just, it's so much fun. It really is. It's just, it's so much fun. Like, hold on, hold on. I, I got to pull this up. I had a thing I know specifically for this. Give me a moment. Uh, yeah, okay. Analytics wise, right? I remember writing this down. My analytics from this podcast tell me that to this day, the potatoes episode is the number one episode. That was the first one we ever did. Mind you, you remember how low quality that thing was? Yeah, audio wise. recorded in the garage. We had... The crappy mic. Yeah, like the Yeti, the Blue Yeti. It, it never worked for us. No, it was a secondhand Blue Yeti that we bought, and we were definitely <laughs> regretting getting it. We understand why it was an open box thing now. Okay, back to Tom Standage. He's literally just a journalist. He's a journalist, and he works for The e Economist. He's, he's British. He works for The Economist as um, the editorial executive. So he probably just really likes food history then. Yeah, I think he's just really into food history, so he looks it up and writes about it, which is honestly how I would write a book. Okay. You know, that makes sense. Honestly, considering that tomorrow I have a meeting with that person who's reaching out about us writing a book, you that may be fun. A book, you but, yeah, Honestly, I don't even know if it's like me even writing a book or if they want to ghostwrite for just ideas that I'd present about different things. Either way, I'm fine. Considering the amount of projects that we have that we're working on, I genuinely don't know. But either way... Once again, getting off topic, today's episode is going to be about edible food history. The short of it, as I've said, is that I love food, I love the history of food, and this book, it gives some really great insight into all the different topics that we have not yet actually covered. Like, we did uh, we did potatoes, we did tomatoes, um, 
I and I know I did tomatoes initially on Patreon and then that went on to the full one. I, I had don't the one think on. We actually posted that to the full one. So I think tomatoes is a Patreon exclusive. It might be. I know pineapple is. Yeah, we did pineapple. We did pineapple. Uh, we also did, of course, beer. Well, that's not a food. Yo, know, but that was the one that we did when it was the history of uh, the world in six classes. So we've done a number of things. I really find the food history to be fascinating, right? So that's what I'm going to do to you today, right? I'm going to feed you some knowledge, and I'm going to make you hungry for more. <laughs> All right, this is going to be spliced in here because I forgot to do this at the very beginning. But, 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 book is on sale for $2.99. I should have specified that. This might be inserted right here immediately after I say it. I don't know, but yeah. That was really bad. I know it was bad. All right, let me have this. Okay, but let me have go this. over... How civilization started through farming? Yeah, or... farming, uh, hunting, gathering, literally everything for it. Humans have always needed food. Every creature basically needs food. So that's that's pretty much what we're going to start with, right? So I do need to start off by saying farming equals civilization. It also sucks. Farming does really suck. And I know you're probably going to look at yeah, I know you're looking at me weird right now, but let me um let me explain, right? Farming is often seen as being superior to hunting and gathering because, I mean, after all, farming came with many numerous benefits, right? You're talking about if you go through a time and place where there is a drought, there's some kind of pestilence, some big disease, you have um, any number of issues, right? Farming is going to give you a way more steady, reliable food support, or not support, food source Source. to support people. That's the point. And that, in turn, is going to allow for more steady population growth, which, in turn, is going to lead to more consolidated civilizations. And that's just that's what's going to happen. Though, in reality, things are a little bit more complex if we're talking about the actual quality of life. And this is a thing that people have talked about on the Internet a lot, which it's not exactly accurate, but there's an argument that they have for it because farming also leads to some significant societal problems that are just there's way too many to actually talk about in just one podcast there really are this includes things like war over land you have famines because the one crop that you were growing like the barley or the wheat or the rice or whatever it fails it like catches some kind of disease you catch diseases yourself from living close with other animals that you're raising you have slavery that arises because of wars and raids in order to put people on farms so that they can grow food for you or other cash crops or also environmental degradation of the land because you're just continuously trying to grow the same crop in the same place and this in the end makes agricultural harder agriculture Agriculture. agriculture harder over the years i know that i'm messing that up here i have cotton mouth first started farming i guess did they at what point did they realize that hey we planted these crops at the same spot every single year for the last 20 years did they just realize hey maybe we shouldn't do that because the crop started failing or did they just keep planting it and then they all starved yeah yeah well that's kind of it's kind of both people learn through trial and error exactly what would happen and this is where you have different farming techniques so that's a little bit scary though because like you planted this land that caused your population to explode yeah right? and then it starts failing so now you have to feed all these people but your crops failing well gabby remember all the things you would tell me about trinidad and what you would do with the bamboo and the stuff and different farmland what do they do in trinidad like how how do they treat the farmland well the well you burn the bamboo yeah to clear yeah that's i mean sorry the bamboo yeah i guess that causes it to be more fertile like from the ash and everything so that's kind of what they would do one of the first innovations in farming was to burn that shit to the ground. Literally, just it would it would be um, it would be slash and burn is the terminology that they would have for it. So you would let all this stuff grow, burn it, let it settle into the ground, right? And then that you'd l- let it leave fallow, like you wouldn't let anything grow on it for a year or so, and then that would rejuvenate the soil. That was that was the basic idea. I'm trying to drink my water. I know you're trying. I, I know you're trying to drink your water. It's fine. It's fine. Like that's that's the gist of it. I'm glad you pointed that out because that's that that is true. That that is definitely what would happen. But in addition to all of uh, these these different things, right? Farming, when people switched over to it, they ended up working more when working in agriculture than they did as hunter gatherers. Like there was a thing where pe- this is this is something to where in hunter gatherer societies, people did work something along the lines of ten to fourteen hours a week to gather food. 
only 10 to 14 hours a week. That, that's pretty much what people Sign would do. Me up. Sign well, it me varies. Up. It's going to depend heavily upon the time and place, right? And there were other places that were more sedentary. The ones who were that were coastal, that were by areas where you could fish, they didn't even have to move or go anywhere. That one was something that was perfect. But also what would happen is that their diet was way more varied. So they would have all different kinds of berries, nuts, vegetables, roots, different meats, all kinds of different things. So hunter-gatherers were on average, it was like something in, um, like, before agriculture, the average height was 5'9 for a man and 5'5 five five for a woman. Do you know what it was a couple thousand years later with agriculture? Like 5'2", five 5'3"? Five yeah. No, 5'3 for a man and then 5' foot for women. And that pretty much, it stayed like that well, because all the way until uh, the Industrial Revolution. They could only grow specific crops and they didn't necessarily grow enough. And weren't they putting, like, dirt in flour at some point well yeah but that's not even it. it it comes down to a matter of nutrition because remember the varied diet you can't just eat one thing forever so if over half of your diet if like 90 percent of your diet comes from specifically one crop like you are growing potatoes potatoes or wheat or something like you're going to get some kind of nutritional deficit that is going to lead to problems for you um like, there was one that they were studying. I can't even remember the name of it. It began with a P. I should have wrote that down. It's like P Pelagia, something along those lines. It, it, it is, it's a kind of disease that up. occurs where it's a disease. It, you can look it up right now. It's a disease that occurs when your diet mostly consists of corn. This was a problem that occurred in a number of Native American societies because the diet primarily consisted of maize, which maize Pelagra? is corn. Pelagra? Was that what it was? Yeah, okay, so Pelagra. I knew, I knew it began with a P. In poor populations throughout the world, actually. Yep, and it became that way because corn, once it was introduced to the rest of the world, it is such a hardy staple crop that it could grow pretty much anywhere. So corn became one of the most dominant things to grow in, like, Africa, Asia, and parts of South America. But it didn't have protein, so that's where they got Pelagra. Yeah, yeah, it, it just it doesn't have enough nutrients but for some people it's literally all that they could have and it's still food and so that's just one of the things that would happen so people these hunter gatherers they would have significantly better teeth their bones would be stronger uh they would live longer on average it was just significantly better it again it wouldn't be until the industrial revolution that people's height and general health began to recover like that that's what it is now also, at the same time, the trade-off is that as a hunter-gatherer, you couldn't support nearly as large of a population because it's a matter of efficiency. You can grow the same amount of food needed to support 25 people in a couple acres, what would take dozens of acres as a hunter-gatherer with stuff just spread out. So if you're looking at the population as it grows— you will reach a cap on what can be supported as a hunter-gatherer much, much, much quicker than you would in agriculture. So as the population grows, agriculture is quite literally necessary. You just, you have to. Unless you're in one of those areas, like, I can't remember the name of it. There's one that was mentioned in the book. It was in Africa. And I remember actually studying that when I was in college. And it was an anthropology class. And there's this tribe in Africa that 90% of their diet comes from, in the form of a, just a nut. It's like the cola nut is what it's called. Is it good? I don't even know if it tastes good. I, I kind of want to try it. But it's very high in protein and fat. It's very high in this nutrition. So it's the majority of their diet. Okay, yeah, but, but they 90% of your diet I'm, is just a nut? Actually, I think I'm exaggerating that. Over half of their calories comes from this nut, and the rest of it comes from the other plants and other stuff that they gather. But that's literally the majority of it, and it grows in such abundance that to this day they are still hunter-gatherers. Because I mean, I do it. Then they just go gather nuts. That they're that's next okay, to them. So you can go do some other boring job, or you could go gather nuts. Yeah, pretty much. Easy like, choice. <laughs> that's just it. That just really is it. So that the lack of variety that you would have in the bones, or the lack of variety that you would find in the diets of these farmers this would then lead to less nutrition that would be reflected in the bones that the archaeologists are going to dig up and find the teeth and bones of hunter gatherers as i said was healthier and it just it, it was better for the individual just not necessarily for the uh not necessarily for the family 
And so those findings have led to some really serious debate as to whether or not the switch to agriculture was a mistake. I say that there's a debate, but you really pretty much see it online. You know exactly what it is that I'm talking about, too. You see it all the time on TikTok. <laughs> you remember on TikTok, you'd see those, um, it's always like some college student that ends up posting something along the lines of, oh, in today's society, and we have to work 40-hour weeks okay, yeah. when our I, hunter-gatherer... I'm, student. I, I'm the college student posting that. Listen, I have a 9 to 5. I would rather gather nuts all day. <laughs> I understand that. You know, there are some serious puns that we could make with that, with you saying that. This is a professional history <laughs> podcast, so we won't be doing that. I know. I could say. We could. We could say things. I'm not going to, but I could. Okay, what was Co your point? Comment section in YouTube. I know already it's going to be filled with it. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's just the gist of it. Farming and all these different things, they're going to occur in different places and they're going to switch over at different times, but it really does depend upon the the time and place. So there were some that did it very early, and I first learned about this when I was reading or listening to this book, and I'd actually never heard of the site before. Gabby, are you familiar with Abu Hureya? Uh, Hureya? Hurea? I think it's Hurea. Hurea. It's probably Hurea. I'm probably mispronouncing I'm that. I'm not familiar with it, so I'm going to look it up. I wasn't either. I wasn't either. So, but check this out. So for anyone that doesn't know what this is, Abu Hurea is the name of the, uh, it's the series of ruins of an ancient settlement that is located in Syria, which is to the south side of the Euphrates Valley, and it's on an abandoned channel of that river, right? The earliest occupation at Abu Hurea was around 13,000 years ago, and this was Abu Huraya the first. This was a permanent, year-round settlement of hunter-gatherers who would gather over 100 different species of edible seeds, fruits, and other kinds of things from the valley and the surrounding region. The settlers would also have access to a bunch of different things like Persian gazelles and other things like that that they could hunt. So these people lived in a cluster of semi-terranean or subterranean pit houses, which means that they were actually partially underground. They weren't fully underground, but I can imagine in a place that could be as hot as Syria, this was something that they, they needed. But beginning around 11,000 BC, the people there experienced some kind of major change. The the region started to get colder. These were the dry, cold conditions that were associated with the Younger Dryas period. This is a period in the time in the Earth when it really started to cool down, and many of the wild plants that the people had relied upon there simply disappeared. So the earliest cultivated species at Abu Huraya appears to have been rye and lentils, like they were one of the first people, if not the first people, to ever really cultivate it and possibly wheat. But, of course, when this happens, and the crops start to die off, the settlement was abandoned. And that was in the second half of the 11th millennium BC. During the later part of Abu Huraya I, which is from 10,000 to 9400 BC, and this being after the original dwelling pits were filled with debris, the people returned to Abu Huraya and they built new above-ground huts with perishable materials, and they grew rye, lentils, and acorn wheat. Like, it's one of the, the first styles of grains that people were harvesting. Now, this is a little side fact before I'm going to get into corn and rice and other stuff like that, but I wanted to first mention it because I at least thought that this was cool because I had never heard of this before. Like, we're talking about 11,000 BC. That is thousands of years before other places were to even attempt anything like agriculture. So I cannot help but wonder that if that shift in climate had not happened, could we potentially have seen large-scale agriculture a few thousand years early? And then if that was the case, what would that mean for people? Like, we're talking about thousands of years, potentially, of advancement that I don't know. We would be in the Jetsons. Me? I, I don't Flying know. Cars. I don't know. It's like there's a, space. there's a lot to be said because it means that the population would have been bigger. But, of course, you have all the diseases and any other thing could happen. But War. We might have wiped out too early because of war. I, I don't know. I don't know. But I find it to be interesting. It's just really cool, in my opinion. So anyway, that's this, this cereals. Okay. Cereals. 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 I, I, I thought that that little bit was cool. And I've mentioned in the past some of the stuff with, uh, with wheat, because we covered that in relation to potatoes and other kinds of crops. But here I wanted to focus a little bit more on maize and a bit of rice. So maize, or corn, that is one of the world's most important crops. 
absolutely, it is massive. It is responsible for about 6% of all of humanity's calorie intake today. That is huge for a singular crop. I would think it would be rice. I mean, the amount of rice I alone. Rice is probably, no, rice is higher. I'm sure rice is higher, but corn is not just calories. It's also industry because corn syrup. Oh, right. Like corn, Sugar, right. corn is used for everything. Corn is not just a food. It is an industrial product. It's used as livestock feed. It's used for fermentation for alcohol. It's used in plastics, ethanol, everything. And so a billion tons of corn are produced every single year. But the history of corn is a little bit controversial because scientists, historians, and archaeologists, they all have different kinds of origin theories for really where it came from. But we, we know that corn, at the very least, came from Latin America. Most scientists agree that corn seems to have come from central Mexico, and it was domesticated around seven or 9,000 years ago from a wild grass called uh, teosinte. And I remember this because I actually looked up for the pron- I did look up pronunciation for this one. It is teosinte. So I did, I did, be proud of me at least for once because I did this one class. first. So teosinte looked nothing like modern corn, really. It was way smaller. It was, uh, they had way fewer kernels. They were more like spaced out. And each one of these was surrounded in a rather tough casing. So you know how, um, Gabby, you know how when you bite into corn, and it's soft, and it's like it explodes in your mouth when you bite the kernels. You know yeah. what I'm... Yeah. Okay. It, imagine... So that little film, you know how it gets stuck in your teeth sometimes? Like when you have a piece of corn stuck in your teeth? You all know exactly what it is that I'm talking about, right? So that little glossy thin piece right there, on teal synthé, imagine if it was an actual tough husk where yeah. you had to peel it and if you it's bit like, it it would be like biting grass that on the inside is a fruit. It's like a pea pod. You have to like peel it open and then it's in the middle. Honestly, since this is going up on YouTube, we could put that picture up there. We could probably it's put it. Cool. Hey, we're sending this over to the podcast editor. Maybe he's going to add it in. It is descended from teal synthé. Modern corn is really nothing like that. It, it's all these close packed kernels. It doesn't exist in the wild. Corn quite literally cannot survive without human intervention. And that is the case with a lot of domestic products. Corn literally will not survive. And that is many, many kinds of plants nowadays. Wait, what do you mean corn wouldn't survive without human intervention? So the way the corn is designed, right, on these natural wild grasses that you had before it, what they would do is that they had many small little stalks, right? So you know how you have the the, the ear of corn? Like that's what it is? So the ear is actually the female part of corn, right? And so corn when it grows it has male parts and female parts and the male part is up higher and it spreads pollen so that it falls down onto the female part and what they do is in the old teosinte there was way way more of each one of male and female but they were smaller and they were harder to deal with that kind of thing now each ear of corn has fewer ears so if before there was 10 now there's Actually, I don't even know how many ears of corn. I don't know how many ears. I'm not a farmer, all right? I don't know how many ears there actually are on a husk of corn, right? I I don't know. But there's significantly fewer than there was, so it required farmers to essentially artificially pollinate their plants because without it, the plants literally would not get pollinated because they have way too few big ears of corn that will not be reached by the male part of the plant. So it wouldn't produce fruit. So basically the farmers go in and they just... Yeah. Oh, have you not seen what they do with pumpkins? No. Okay. For anyone on YouTube right now, what? literally type this in. This is going to be weird. If you're on YouTube, when this video is over, go and type in pumpkin pollinating. It is some weird stuff to really look at because pumpkin flowers are massive. So they're taking these parts and they're just like sticking it in and swirling it around. And it's, it looks kind of funky. When you, I've seen several of the videos of like the uh, the pumpkin winners of like so the you contest. you watch a lot of pumpkin pollinating. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. On TikTok, filled with it. <laughs> filled with it. I may not get the big booty girls, but I get pumpkin pollinating. Okay. That's the thing that pops up on my page. But. What you'd see, what you'd see is that they would have to artificially pollinate because otherwise it's a significantly lower chance of it occurring. 
So these early farmers in Mexico domesticated uh, teal synthe by selecting the biggest and best kernels until the crop we recognize today as maize or corn was born. And so maize spread really fast because this was nutritious, it was very easy to grow, it was easy to store, it was easy to carry, it was just a really good, solid crop. And its domestication would spread all the way south, going to the coast, to Peru, to beyond, all across North Americas, until eventually Native Americans all over the continent had adopted it as a very standard part of their food supply. And before long, it was a staple food across most cultures in North and South America, as well as the Caribbean. So maize was the king of foods. It was the holiest of foods. And it was featured in a whole bunch of different Native American myths that I went and I, I was just looking up corn myths. Like, literally, that's one of the things I spent like an hour of doing that just today. Like, when I was writing this, I was like, hmm, I need to go find corn myths. And there are a lot of different corn myths from tribes all over. But I figured that if we're talking corn we need to look at the origins primarily like where this um where the stuff comes from so that's where i was going and looking at the aztec and the maya and the others right so the before the aztec you had the maya which was an older civilization and they believed that their ancestors were actually made directly out of corn so not Dirt, like Christians believe. Yeah, not corn. clay. Because in many cultures, you know, you're right. In many cultures, clay is one of the most common things that people are made out of, right? Yeah. But I like it being corn because if it's what feeds you and keeps you alive and keeps your entire civilization alive, I mean, it makes sense. Like, we, everyone comes from corn. It does. We're all corn. It does. We're it's all corn. corn. Okay. If they don't, he's if you got guys the juice. You, you, you like, know. you stab someone. They got the juice. <laughs> if you guys don't know that TikTok audio, I'm so sorry. <laughs> My apologies. So, okay. The story of the Mayan creation myth goes like this. And I'm going to read verbatim from this just so that I have it. Long, long ago, there were two creator gods. You had a god and a goddess who got together in darkness to talk about the creation of the present world. The god suddenly asked, what materials can we use to create people? So I know, answered the goddess, our friends the jaguar, the coyote, the parrot, and the crow. They've already found the answer. We're, we will use corn. This beautiful land where lots of white and yellow corn grew, called Paxil, a mountain split open, also had lots of fruits and seeds, like beans, cocoa, wild plums, and honey. Fine, said the god, we must press on. There is little time left before the dawn comes. So the human's flesh was made of white, that's male, and yellow, that's female, corn. Their arms and legs were made of corn meal. The gods ground enough corn to make enough gruel to fill nine gourds, and that gave the men muscles, strength, and power. First, these men could not speak, hear, or see, and they had enough feeling in their hands to hold things. They were given intelligence, and they could see for miles and miles. They could see things both near and far up in the sky, and they even managed to see all four corners of the earth. In fact, they could see so much that the gods thought about it and said, Wait a minute, that is not good. We've given these people too much power so that they are just like us. We must cloud their vision so that they can no longer see all as we see. So they threw a mist over people's eyes and their vision blurred, as when one breathes on a mirror. And from then on, they could only see what was near to them. Then the gods decided to make partners for them. While the men slept at night, four women were just placed beside four? them. Four? Like there, there four was... per man? No, no, there was four men, so they placed four women. Oh, okay. So they, 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 they each got their own pair. So when the men finally woke up, they were amazed at the gods' creations. And many nations were created and multiplied. There was dark skin, pale skin, people of all sorts. And in the beginning, they all shared one language and all remembered the words of the creators and gave thanks to them. So that's, that's, I know it's a very simplified version of it, but that is the gist of it. When I, when I looked this up and I got it, this quite literally came from a children's explanation of the corn myth. You can tell from like the fact that it didn't use any of the language, any of the, uh, the names and other things in here, that that's what it was. The next one that I got though was the Aztec and that one is a little bit more violent but that is one of the legends that recounts of uh, four destroyed worlds that is believed by the Aztecs to have existed before the creation of this world in time, which is the fifth sun. And by sun, I don't mean like 
a son is in your child. I mean, this is like the fifth universe that we've existed in because the gods destroyed the other ones. It's kind of like how, um, you know how the Greeks believed in the age ages? You had the Golden Age or the Silver Age or the Bronze Age. You had these different things. And you had different species of men and giants and all different kinds of things that existed in those different time periods. Yeah. It was like the age of legends and heroes. It's kind of like that, except if you wanted to take Noah's Ark and the dinosaur myth and go, um, I say dinosaur myth. <laughs> I'm not saying like dinosaurs are myth. Dinosaur I'm myth. saying if you combined Noah's Ark with dinosaurs, and this is the Aztec <laughs> gods going, you know, no, don't like it. Wipe it out. We're going to start over again. And apparently that happened like four times. And now you have the current era that we live in, which is the fifth sun. So that's where that is. So these episodes are just full of excitement because in them you have the creator gods and here's where we're going to get to the names. So I apologize. Te, uh, Tezca, what? Tezcatlipoca. Te, Tezcatlipoca. Okay. So Tezcatlipoca and Quetzalcoatl and they are given the task of making the fifth sun and inhabiting it with different beings. And by tearing the earth monster, Tlatzacutli or Tetzacutli. Tlatzacutli. Tlal. This is going to be one of those things. I there was a there was a girl I can't even remember her name on here, but she uh, followed me on TikTok. She's one of my friends on there, and she is a Nahuatl speaker there in Mexico. And she she helped me with pronunciation on a number of things. I kind of wish that I had contacted her before making this episode that she could help me. I'm sure if she ends up listening to this or someone shares this to her, I'm going to get roasted so hard. But what do you deserve? So the earth monster was torn in two, and the earth and celestial sky then materialized from it. The task of making humans is then allocated to Quetzalcoatl, and he travels to the underworld to ask the Lord of Death, Mictlantecutli, I think, for the precious bones that he is guarding. I'm going to get so many comments from this. I already know. And so after passing many harrowing tests that was set by... Be- the Lord of Death. The Lord of Death. In return for the bones, the Lord then cheats Quetzalcoatl, who is forced to steal them. So to Quetzalcoatl's dismay, the Lord of Death's helpers chase him out of the underworld, and the bones fall on the ground in the rain, and they break. So despite that setback, he picks them up, and he returns them to the god's paradise of Tamonachan. And there, he sprinkles them with his own blood after the god Quilatsi, or Quixacotl, had ground them up. Thus, the first two humans were made. But here's the gist of it. Although these humans were now alive, they immediately started to die because they became really weak. And the gods realized, oh, wait, we just created people, but they have nothing to eat. Which, mind you, I find this story dark and hilarious because it makes me think of the first time that a, um, like, you know what I mean? When you get, like, a first-time mom, maybe she was raised, she has no little cousins, she has no siblings, she has nothing, maybe only child, has only been an only child for her entire existence, nothing else related whatsoever. And then she has a kid, and she's like, what do I, what do do I actually this? do? Oh, so you're talking, is this like just talking to me? No, 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 no. Joya, and they're like, hold her head up, and I was like, no, because like you, why? You had Wayne, right? You, had, I mean, you had some. He was five. I, yeah, but that's still a kid, at least. I'm talking about like no one, because this was like no experience whatsoever. But then what happens is Quetzalcoatl spots a red ant who is carrying a maize kernel and so he follows the ant and reaches a place where the maize grows called the mountain of sustenance or tonakatpetl and this there quetzalcoatl turns himself into a black ant and he stole a kernel of corn to bring back to the humans to allow them to plant and then boom now we have food that that that's how that works there so it's like this whole process of trying to create people they have to go through this whole trial and then in the end they're like crap we didn't we forgot to feed them (laughs) <laughs> it's just funny. Now, that all being said, the um the Chinese rice myth is kind of like this. But also in my opinion is just kind of funny. Can you can you guess why? You have why? the note you have the notes in front of you. Do you, do you want to tell them this one? Do you want to tell this one? So go go for it. Go for it. I w- I want to hear Gabby tell this story. Okay. A Chinese story says that although rice has always existed, there was a time that the ears of the rice plants were not filled. Observing that humans were near starvation, the goddess Guan Yin took pity on them. 
She went secretly to the rice fields and squeezed her breast so that milk flowed into the ears of the rice plants. To complete her task, she pressed harder and a mixture of blood and milk flowed into the plants. This is the reason today we have both white and red rice. Okay. Fine. I'm just coughing now because I'm laughing. I'm sorry. It's just one of those things. It's like there are myths all over the world and there are weird things everywhere. I just find always the stuff that involve um, people like the parts of gods and things to be hilarious when talking about creation. Like, remember the whole thing with... How um, hard do you have to press for blood and milk to flow? I don't know. That's the thing that when I read that, I was like, oh, dear Lord. (laughs) Not okay. Maybe she was chapped. Like, maybe she's just walking out all day, no covering, and she's chapped. I don't know. But either way, either way, I found that hilarious. But regardless of the mythological origins, right, these are the different items that built civilization. Because agriculture, even though people had less time to do things because you're spending now way more time growing food, because of the amount of food that is being produced, this means that at least some people are going to be free to be able to pursue different jobs other than worrying about what they're going to eat that day. The, these guys who weren't going to become farmers would be taking on roles of like artisans for pottery and other stuff, soldiers, the priests, the administrators, the artists, the scholars, all these different groups. And as early civilizations began to take shape, all the political and religious leaders around would rise up to rule over them, creating classes, the people who would be the haves and the have nots, you know, it, it's how civilization really comes about. Whereas in hunter gatherer societies, People generally viewed, it seems that they were viewed more equally. Resources tended to belong to everyone, even though there was a degree of hierarchy. And agriculture led to a more cementing of a system where you had ownership over the land, food, currency, and it was not equally distributed among the different people. But as time goes on, more types of food would drive more expansion. Because people talk about gold, and resources, and all these different things. But spice is a food. Like, spice is a food. It is something that you consume. You physically consume it. And spices today, I know that we talked about this when we did stuff for the Vok, and I know that I've talked about it multiple times when we did things for the um, Crusades. Remember how we did all the stuff for the Crusades and the other stuff? Today, spices are very common. They're quite inexpensive. Some are moderately expensive, at least by our standards, but not by the standards of what they were hundreds of years ago. They generate a huge amount of wealth for the people that control them. Because the spice trade began in the Middle East over 4,000 years ago. And Arabic spice merchants, they used to go around creating all these crazy stories. Like, remember, uh, remember, I know you listened to the one that we did with uh, when I was had my interview with Valeria. And we were talking about the Norse lying about having unicorn horns. Yeah, with walrus tests. Yes. Okay, so the Arabs did something similar when it came to spices. Because they would go around saying, like, this spice only grows on a certain cliff that you have to scale up and fight this, like, giant (laughs) eagle to get. And, like, they would just create the weirdest, craziest backstory stories but because you couldn't grow or get the spice anywhere people were like well shit of course that's where it comes from let me put this down in my encyclopedia here in this book of knowledge that i'm writing on like middle eastern affairs and just people would believe it for hundreds of years they can't be mad if they got it wrong right because they said so (laughs) yeah so they would do this, right, because then they would be able to raise the prices of spice because it was this super exotic thing, which it was exotic. It was hard to get, but they would make it even more so than it was. Initially, the spice trade was conducted mostly by uh, camel caravans over land routes. You had the Silk Road, which was a very important route connecting Asia with the Mediterranean world, and that included North Africa and Europe. Trade on the Silk Road was a significant factor in the development of the great civilizations of China. You had India, Egypt, Persia, Arabia, and Rome. Which Rome was one of the first great big states to really try to get into things with the spice trade. Okay, wasn't the Silk Road super dangerous? Oh, very. I remember we watched Marco Polo and it was, it took years? Very, yeah. It was dangerous. But if you won trip and you're set for life. Okay, yeah, but they would leave their families for years. And they don't even know if they're going to return because anything can happen once you get to your destination. But set for life. It's like the stock market, but worse. Yeah. 
pretty much. That that's kind of what being a merchant was like. It was it was definitely a high risk thing that could happen at certain during certain times. It's one of the reasons why the Chinese during their uh, more powerful periods put huge amount of resources into garrisoning parts of the West. Like, you ever seen how, when you look at China, you have the huge swath of the Gobi Desert, and then you see on the maps, it has, like, a tail that just swings out way oh, into yeah. the, the West? Yeah. Yeah, Silk Road. So That's the, what the Silk Road was. Yeah, so that's one of the paths that they would head. So that's where it would go, and you'd have all different kinds of outposts and different things along the way that would be guarding and protecting it. There was a, um, there was a, a force... That China had, I believe it called it was called the um, the 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 Western Protectorate. I'm not I'm not sure if that is the exact answer, but it was like a semi autonomous state that would exist at different points when China would essentially send out a massive army with a military force and go, okay, rule over this kind of foreign country here in the West. You're, you're, you'd guard this. And that Western power would be there trying to subdue all the tribes and all the different things and keeping the Silk Road open to keep China's wealth flowing. And that's what they would do. Rome was always trying to get access to all these different spices for years. As an example, another historical value of what is now a common spice, Roman soldiers at the time were frequently paid in salt, which is where the word salary comes from. I know that's a very common fun fact that people love to throw around is it a common fun fact it, it's one of those ones at least in the history sphere it's like i have a harder time nowadays judging of oh what is a common fun fact because i'm a history guy on tiktok and other stuff and so i'll hear the same thing three times and be like oh yeah that's a common fact and then i'll hear another person go oh my god i never knew that and I it's never like knew that. and it's like I, I have a harder time judging it now because of that i used to be able to know what was more common and what was not and now I have a difficult time telling, so I just end up saying everything. You you know I say everything. I, I do everything. <laughs> so, Rome tries to get involved in the spice trade. It, at one point, Rome ran into this massive gold deficit because they took over large swaths of Egypt. The majority of the budget of Rome specifically came out of Egypt for two reasons— First, food. The Nile Delta, ridiculously fertile. They would get so much stuff out of it in terms of crops. Second thing, though, was the spice trade, because by sailing up the Nile and then going across over into, um, like, over into the Red Sea, you would then be able to go to India to get spices. And they would only really trade for gold and other precious metals, so what ended up happening is that Rome had a huge deficit of precious metals that was exiting the empire. So this created some large problems later because they quite literally did not have the gold to go around. This also coupled with them having other economic issues, which is where they would then debase their currency. So they would take a coin, cut it in half, mix that gold coin with like 50% something else, and then remint it. So now you have two coins. So they were literally printing money. That's what they did, except metal. It's a brilliant solution. Yes, and never ever in history has ever caused a problem. Ever. Definitely not. But that is where that comes from. Later on, Venice becomes really prosperous by getting involved with the spice trade. They charge huge tariffs because people don't really have direct access to the Middle Eastern source. And European people could really do nothing else but pay the stupidly high prices that were being charged. Even the wealthy had to pay a stupid amount for spices. It was just not something that poor people really could get. So they really decided to do something about it. So in the 15th century, the spice trade was just completely transformed by the age of discovery with Europe. Because by that time, you had navigational equipment that allowed you to take better, longer sailing trips. Like, they just became more possible. So all these rich people go and begin outfitting explorers in the hopes of circumnavigating, or not circumnavigating at this point, um, circumventing. So they're trying to go around the Middle East to cut out the middlemen in order to find new ways to reach the areas where spices would grow. And there were many voyages that completely missed the targets, but several of them ended up doing some pretty new things. Like, as an example, Christopher Columbus setting out to find India, but instead he finds America. And then, of course, he brings back to Spain all these different fruits and vegetables and things that he finds, including chiles, which he actually called them peppers. 
maybe that was to soothe the disappointment of the people who were like, oh, yes, you found spices, which technically he did find things that were spicy and he called them peppers. But at the time, those weren't peppers. We call them chili peppers now. But those aren't peppers. The chilies. Chilies. Chilies? Chilies? I'm probably screwing that up somewhere in my head here now and I'm second guessing myself, but you get what it is that I mean. And of course, Columbus is then responsible for introducing all the different stuff to Europe. You have the potato, the tomato, and all the other things which we have done episodes on before and their own kind of wacky story. But guys, there is way, 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 way too much to cover. If you want to learn more about it, then what you need to do is you need to go and get the rest of it by picking up this month's book, which is on sale right now for only $2.99. So go do it. Link in the description. But yeah, no, obviously check it out. That's really the end of it. I wanted to, at the end, put in a whole bunch of other little like food fun facts. And then I thought like, man, the only ones that are coming to <laughs> mind are the ones that I've already done so many different things on. Because there, there, there are a ton. There are so many different fun food facts. But it's like whether it is people believing that the potato and the tomato are poisonous, the pineapple being the fruit of kings and being ridiculously expensive to the point that people would rent it out at parties. Um, there's just so, so the many. Pumpkin pollination. Oh, now pumpkin pollination. Yes. I mean, come on. Fair. Fair. <laughs> But that is the end of today's episode. I appreciate all of you for joining in and listening, or maybe even watching. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where it is that you're viewing this now. Uh, there's going to be at least five views. They might all be from me. But. I love you. <laughs> anyway, I appreciate all of you. Thank you very much for joining in, and I hope you'll have a good rest of your day. Goodbye, guys. Bye.